It's story time once again with Jeff Young. And today's story is actually a poem. And it has something to do with trees, which given the background certainly seems to make sense. It also has a character in it who refers to himself as a Victorian gentleman, which would be one of the reasons that I might have dressed up this way. This story originally appeared in Cemetery Moon, and this issue is something you can't find any longer, so I certainly don't feel bad about sharing it with you. And this is something that was produced by Fortress Publishing, and you can find Fortress Publishing online at fortresspublishinginc.com. So I was on vacation at one point in time in New Orleans, and I was driving with a friend, and I happened to look out the window, and I saw in someone's property two very large sycamore trees. And these sycamore trees had grown large limbs that were basically coming towards each other. And I don't know whether or not it was the result of the owner of the property or if nature actually took its course. I'd love to believe that this sort of happened by by accident. But there was a marble angel and the wings of the angel were entwined in the are in the limbs of the tree. So it looked like the trees had literally picked the angel up and were holding it in midair. Now it's such a weird thing that it sort of sticks in your head. And at the same time, you suddenly feel a need that you have to do something with something like that. So this is the result and it is called the idol in the trees. At the end of the lawn, near the course of the stream, lay the start of things and the end. My young Helen, an imaginative sort, bright in pink ribbons, and hair to mock the sun's gold would run through the estate's fields. And being the child at heart so true, I would try to keep with, uh, up with her. But Helen was spry, almost a sprite, and in those schoolless summer days, impossible to keep up with in pace. So I would retire to my decor, more befitting a Victorian gentleman's style. And what wondrous things she found without my supervision joke, what dangers she faced in both in truth real and imagined. At the first wind of night's coming, she would come dancing back, chains of flowers strung in her hair. They puzzled me with their detail, such care in their fashioning. Patience being a virtue, I was certain she lacked. Who, or is it you, that makes these, I would inevitably ask. Only to be greeted by soft laughter, followed by a shy shake of the head. And so I trailed along after when I could, another vigilant shadow in silence, but I couldn't keep up or stay near. And then came the wooden toys, so skillfully crafted, flowing with the grain, as if the wood had grown into such a useful fashion, sized and made just for her hands. Next week were the stones, so many in color, texture and shine, polished smooth as if gnawed by a river but each an eye-catching magpie feast. So I finally let her lead me around the fields with her firm promise to understand such fragility as age had imposed upon me. And she kept her pace down to show me the splendid wonders of her everyday world, the fall of cherry blossoms through green warren tunnels of the orchard, a sonata of water drops falling from the lichen-encrusted cliffside. And as the shadows lengthened, we drew away from the lawn, near the small stream's run, where two giant sycamores engaged in a tangle-bowed wrestling match for the prize of the sun's light. Or perhaps so it seemed then. Under the join of the two huge branches lay the wreaths of flowers. A branch from each tree wound around the other. They're not as tight as a hand clasp, or rather like cupped secretive hands. And here and there a flash of white stone slipped into view from wooden knuckles. Impulsive Helen dropped my hand to race after her bestrewn gifts. I followed at my own slower pace as she decked herself with flowers. I studied the tree's strange knot but could not fathom the design of what seemed marble caught up into this mysterious wooden grip. And as I turned away, mind deep in thought, I heard two soft sounds, and turning, saw Helen with two wooden soldiers, each hewn of grainy white temper, and polished to the point of slickness. To my eyes these seemed born of the air, and then the night breeze ran fingers through Helen's golden hair, and she tugged at me, now impatient to go. So we left the edge of the wood, and the ever-silent sycamore twins, but I swear I saw their knotted limbs, 
suddenly seemed to writhe and reveal strange white stone faces in the fading sun. I blamed the light, superstition, and my eyes, all for failing me and led Helen home. In the days that followed, the gifts grew strangely more elaborate, wooden rings and bracelets in her size, stone shaped into serious little chessmen, and the flower chains linked up with gold. And then the fatal day came when the night wind drifted in and did not bring the lively Helen with its cold and ominous chill. So I went out in my slow fashion, desperately waving the lantern about, crying myself hoarse in the throat like some wretched mad thing, hobbling along the tree-lined estate until I found her, this silent, spangled in the moonlight. She was quiet then and quiet still, with the sweet flower blooms about her tender young neck, whose touch to my hands was icy cold, and her eyes were a started staring horror. I bundled her up and staggered home, never aware of my error in judgment. She lay like one in a fever all night and then day, and morning's light found her with a new necklace, a fresh wildflower chain clumsily done, and the next night I waited and spied. So when she left before dawn's coming, I followed from afar with stealthy care, for she only confirmed my suspicions, threading the path by the stream to the twin entangled sycamore trees. In the half light of the coming dawn, the knot seemed to twitch and unclench in my unsure eyesight. The lantern hung like a weight in my hand, even more so the other thing I carried, something that no one could call reason had prompted me to include on this excursion. Helen was there and so inhumanly silent, before the knot standing wrapped. In its mysterious motion and convolutions, the first touch of true daylight took away my hope and reason for good, while the knot unclenched to display its treasure, and my strangled cry grew into sudden motion as I hefted the ax, the unreasonable burden. And in these moments now, as I strike against the hard coils of sycamore flesh, I relive the sudden view of truth, and as this hard, cold Helen strikes me with futile little bald fists, crying like the wind through the trees, I know the horrid changeling deed done in the green shadowed shade. My daughter is now the idol in the trees. So, thanks for playing. That's another story time with Jeff Young.